It's the relationship show that'll get your audience talking. It's Ask Dr. Love, but don't take our word for it. Just ask Bill Main, Operations Manager, WDUN Atlanta. She's got content. I mean, she certainly knows the buttons to hit. Bob Allen from KVTA Los Angeles. It's very interesting, and the younger audience, they follow right along with the program. Dr. Jamie Turndorf is Dr. Love. She may be a clinical psychologist, but she's also entertaining, funny, and connects with listeners. She has a nice, friendly voice. I like it. Subject matter? Wow. She's obviously got a lot going on there. Isn't that what we're really looking at at the bottom line? It's appointment listening each weekend across America. Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. From a practical standpoint, there's probably a lot of folks that listen to it, but they never admit it. Ask Dr. Love, a great match for your format. Even a nighttime CHR station. Sure. Play it like on a Friday night or a Saturday night. Now, check out Ask Dr. Love for yourself. Then, when you're ready to get started, just fax back the agreement or call toll-free to lock in your market. Now, Ask Dr. Love with clinical psychologist, author, love and relationship expert, Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D., expert advice on love and relationships. Now, here's Dr. Love. Welcome to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and it's my pleasure to be with you again tonight. Tonight's topic is how to tell if you're a fighting junkie and how to kick the habit. Did you know that millions of couples are addicted to fighting and don't even realize The reason is because fighting provides hidden perks that include paying back people who harmed you in the past and even creating emotional space and distance. So stay tuned as I help you decipher whether you and your partner are indeed fighting junkies and discover my top tips for breaking free of this relationship destructive dance of death. Later in the show, I'll be taking your live calls. And I also have two surprises for you. Tonight, I'm introducing my Reading Between the Sheets segment. I bet you can guess what that's all about. And I'm also bringing my celebrity couch to the show. Tonight on the couch is John Travolta. Wait until you hear how men are coming out of the woodwork claiming Travolta tried to put the wood to them. So stay tuned as I peel back the layers of Travolta's psyche to find out what's suddenly causing his alleged sexual antics in massage parlors for which he's now facing criminal charges. Now on to tonight's topic, how to tell if you're a fighting junkie and how to kick the habit. So did you know that millions of couples worldwide make both a career and a hobby out of fighting? I've actually coined the term fighting junkies to describe this common pattern. A popular example of fighting junkies was depicted in the movie The War of the Roses. Well, you've heard the saying, they were swinging naked from a chandelier to describe a couple having wild sex. Well, in this couple's final showdown, they ended up swinging fully clothed from a not well-hung chandelier and they crashed to their deaths. It's no joke to say that being a fighting junkie is going to kill you. This is because couples who live in this climate end up killing each other, if not literally like the roses, but figuratively because chronic fighting harms your health, meaning fighting junkies end up sicker and actually die prematurely. So I bet you're wondering what causes a person to become a fighting junkie. Well, if you've been following me for a while, you know that old scars from childhood cause us to unconsciously choose partners who help us to relive the worst, most traumatic aspects of our childhood. This is called the repetition compulsion, and it's a universal phenomenon. So what happens is you choose a partner who emotionally reminds you of the parent who let you down or harmed you. You do this because you have an unconscious fantasy that if you try hard enough and if you're a good enough person, you'll be able to succeed in fixing what went wrong in your childhood and achieving what I call your happy ending, meaning this time around you're going to succeed in getting the kind of treatment from your partner, the love, the attention, and so on, that you always needed from your parent. And when this happens, you will feel as though you healed your childhood wound. Sounds really good on paper, but it never works out this way. The reason this plan never works out is because your partner is limited and damaged in the exact same way that your parent was. So you just end up beating your head on a rock, trying to get blood from a stone rather than achieving your happy ending. So you end up more and more disappointed, injured, hurt, and angry. But here's the catch. The need to heal is so great 
that you feel compelled. That's the repetition compulsion. You feel compelled to never give up, never walk out. You just stay in the ring and keep swinging and fighting because to give up would feel like abandoning the hope of ever healing your old scars. But there's more. As you keep on fighting with your partner, beating your head on a rock, trying to get through to your partner to get him or her to change and give you your happy ending, you're also getting your rocks off because you're unconsciously venting a mountain of stored up rage toward your parent. Soon you've even forgotten what happy ending you even wanted. Now you're just fighting because it's familiar to live in a state of war. But the problem is, anger is like a cancer. It feeds on itself. And the angrier you are, the angrier angrier you become and the more you fight. And now you are an official fighting junkie. So how can you tell if you and your partner are fighting junkies? Well, here's the first clue. It's called stability of conflict, or what I call the broken record phenomenon. This means you're fighting the same sorry-ass fight over and over, year after year. Here's another clue. You secretly look for things to fight about, and you're even picking fights. Here's another. You're secretly most comfortable when you're fighting. Another. You feel like you don't want to let your partner close to you because deep down you're afraid that your partner would hurt or reject you. Here's another clue. Your parents always fought. It's what you know. And another clue. You've been fighting since the beginning of your relationship. And if any or all of these clues sound like you and your partner, you are officially a fighting junkie. Now, are you wondering how you can break free of this deadly cycle? To break free, you've got to first admit that you are a fighting junkie. You know, it's like going to AA. You stand up and you say, hi, I'm John, and I'm an alcoholic. The first step to healing is admitting the condition. So after you admit the condition, then you need to be clear on your particular reason for being a fighting junkie. Well, the first reason is it's familiar. The second is it's a conflict resolution communication skill deficit. The third possible reason is it's your way to avoid intimacy and closeness because you're afraid to face the loss of love due to rejection, abandonment, or even death. And the last reason for being a fighting junkie is you don't have a strong sense of self and fear that giving over to intimacy is synonymous with being taken over. All right. Once you know the reason why you're a fighting junkie, you need to make a conscious choice to stop mutilating each other and instead vow to help each other heal your old scars so you can both achieve your mutual happy endings. Now, helping each other to heal is actually the divine purpose of our intimate relationships. And if you're ready to reach for healing rather than the boxing gloves, Use my book, Till Death Do Us Part, Unless I Kill You First, which is going to teach you my proven step-by-step conflict resolution program. And my book is also going to guide you on how to help each other heal your old scars, overcome all the sources of your fear of intimacy, and fill in any conflict resolution communication skills deficits you have. Okay. Now, let me share some tweets on this topic. You know, my tweets are being tweeted all over the web. So I encourage you to share my tweets with your friends and your loved ones so you can be a pebble in the pond. By spreading the word, you're creating a ripple effect of growth and healing. So here they are. Definition of a fighting junkie whore? A person who's addicted to relationship war. Recipe for romance? Spending more time making love than strapping on the boxing glove. Here's another. To give romance a nudge, you gotta hang up the boxing glove. Yet another. Someone who keeps a running fight score is the quintessential fighting junkie whore. And here's another. If you don't get the fighting junkie monkey off your back, you might as well be addicted to crack. And another tweet. A fighting junkie is a relationship flunky. And couples that play together stay together. Couples that constantly fight together quickly reach the end of their tether together. And last but not least, drum roll, please. A relationship riddled with fighting is like a life sentence without parole. You can free yourself from this dead-end relationship hole. 
Okay, now I'm going to take a quick break. And when I return, I'll be reading between the sheets. Be right back. Dr. Jamie Turndorf is Dr. Love. To ask Dr. Love your question on love and relationships, call now, 888-463-6748. That's 888-GO-FOR-IT. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Now is the time in the program for me to read between the sheets to tackle your toughest sexual questions. You know, over the years, people have mistakenly thought that because I'm known as Dr. Love, I must be a sex therapist, which isn't true. But it is true that sex is a part of relationships, if you're lucky. But the truth is, there was one night when I played the part of a sex therapist, the night I impersonated Dr. Ruth. Let me tell you about it. I was lying in bed, delirious with fever. My husband was beside me as we watched Dr. Ruth's show, Good Sex. So you remember, she had an announcer named Larry, and Larry reads her this question that came in from a guy who says that he was married to a woman for many years who had a dreadful vaginal odor, and he never told her. Now she's engaged to be married, and he's not sure if he should share this information with her. So Dr. Ruth says to him, you should send her a bouquet of roses. And with the roses, you know, the floral card that accompanies the roses, you should write her a little note. And on the front of the card, you should say, Dear honey, I always loved you. And on the back side of the card, you should say, But you always had this vaginal odor, and I think you should see your gynecologist and get it checked out. So here I am, lying in the bed, delirious with fever, and I say, No, 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 that's not what he should write on the card. He should write on the front, Roses are red, violets are blue. And on the back side, These flowers smell sweet, wish your crotch good too. So there was my one-night stand as a sex therapist. Now, seriously, let me get on to the question that came in, and it's a toughie. Dear Dr. Love, my husband and I have been married for about two years, and we have yet to consummate our marriage because it seems he suffers from premature ejaculation. I am increasingly frustrated, and he is still not seeking treatment. What should I do? Thank you in advance for your help. Okay, look, this is a very touchy situation. You say that you haven't been able to consummate your marriage because he suffers from premature ejaculation. I'm assuming you mean that he ejaculates before he enters you. The fact that he isn't seeking treatment can mean two things. First, he may be ashamed to seek help because this would mean openly admitting his problem. And second, there may be underlying emotional factors that cause him to not want to solve the problem. In other words, he actually may be comfortable with not having intercourse because of various unconscious fears and conflicts. And just so you know, many people are afraid of becoming close to another person. There are all kinds of fears associated with emotional closeness, such as the fear of loving and losing through death or abandonment. There's also a terror of merger itself. And if your husband was raised by a very controlling, dominating, smothering mother, he would probably be afraid at the idea of getting too close to you for fear that you'll devour him emotionally and psychologically. So one way to keep distance is to literally not merge on a physical level. And the question now is how to determine which of the two possibilities is going on. Keep in mind that your husband is very emotionally fragile. So when we bring this issue to a head, We have to be gentle. No accusations, no pressure. pressure. Just talk to him in a loving way and say you want to understand where he's coming from. No pun intended. So start by asking him if he's comfortable with the lack of intercourse. If he is comfortable, then we know that he is using his third leg to keep you at arm's length. So you can begin to explore the fears that underlie the dysfunction and see if he bites and talks about having had a mother who smothered him or whether he's afraid to love and lose you. Talking is the main way to work through the fears. Once he's talked about it, you can then bring up the suggestion that you go together to talk to a therapist. Tell him that you want to work together to find a way to have intercourse while ensuring that you give him the right space in other ways if he's afraid of being smothered, or the right reassurances if he's afraid of loving and losing. Now, if he says he is not comfortable with the lack of intercourse, then you want to ask him why we 
Now, notice we is more neutral and less accusatory than why you. Okay, so why do we, why are we not doing anything to resolve the problem? Ask him if he feels ashamed to ask for help. If he says he is ashamed to ask for help, then tell him that you will work with him to solve this. He's not alone. And tell him that millions of men have this issue. And for many men, it's simply a matter of learning how to teach the body to delay orgasm. It's a skill that can be learned like any other. So basically what we're talking about is recognizing what's called the premonitory sensations. These are the sensations just before the point of no return. You can fix the problem at home by practicing one of two techniques. The first one is called the stop-start technique, and the second is called the squeeze technique. So the stop-start involves you manually stimulating him until he reaches the point just before the point of no return. And then he tells you, and you stop stimulating him till his feelings and sensations settle down. You start again, and you keep repeating that cycle as he trains himself to wait. Now, the squeeze technique is similar, only instead of stopping, you take your thumb, index, and middle finger, and you hold it just below the coronal ridge in the front and the back of the head of the penis. And again, just before he reaches the the point of no return, you squeeze. When the sensations settle down, you stimulate him manually again. And you keep on building up these cycles until he becomes practically an expert in waiting uh, until eternity. But not exactly, but you get the idea. Make this a fun and low-key process. And let me know how you make out, because I know things are going to be looking up for you in the bedroom. All right. I'm going to take another quick break. And when I return, I'll be answering your live calls. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Now is the time in the show when I go to the phone. My first caller is Jordan. Hello, Jordan. What's your question for me? Basically, my problem, um, I'm 18 years old, um, about halfway to 19. My girlfriend just turned 17, and we've been dating for a a year and a month now. Uh, At the beginning of of the relationship, um, just like most new relationships, you know, our priorities were flipped to we wanted to hang out with each other almost 24 seven, you know, we just, we tried as much as we could to hang out. We loved being around each other. And something I've noticed is in the last three or four months is my priorities have started to change, especially with the end of the school year coming around. I just graduated. Um, I started to make her not my top priority. Yeah. I put school and family above her. It's not that I don't care about her as much, yeah, I still love her the same way I did. It's just I am focusing more on other things than I am with her. And she's still in the in the state where she's focusing on me. And she is getting the vibe that I am no longer interested in her and that I, that I, that I don't care for her the same way I did. And I'm trying to explain to her that, you know, it's not that I don't care for her or I don't want to be around her. It's that I have other things that I need to take care of. All right, Jordan, I listened very carefully to what you said. And what I'm going to tell you is really going to shock you. You said that she's no longer my number one priority. I heard you say it. And this is what's getting you into hot water with her. The bottom line is a woman needs to feel that she's your number one. Now, I'm not saying that you need to become attached to her at the hip. You don't have to be with her 24-7, not at all. I'm talking about giving her the right feeling, letting her know that she is first in your heart and that you're always thinking about her. You know, my husband, he'd often call me when he'd cross the bridge on his way to work. He was leaving me, going in the opposite direction, but he'd call to say that he was missing me or thinking of me. If you give your girl the right emotional communication, give her the feeling that she's first in your heart, then you can go to the moon. You can take care of your priorities. You can work. You can deal with anything, and she'll be fine. And let me give you another example that guys always understand. 
a husband and wife are at a jewelry store, okay? The wife sees a ring. She turns to her husband and she says, oh, look at that ring. Well, obviously, the ring is too expensive. He can't afford to buy it. So he says to her, what are you, nuts? You think I'm made of money? Men make the mistake of focusing on doing or not to doing. Either I buy the ring or I don't buy the ring. But for a woman, buying the ring is less important than giving her the right feeling. So if you were to say, I'd love to buy you that ring. It would look so beautiful on your finger. When I have the money, that's the ring I'm going to get you. You don't have to buy the ring so long as you give the right feeling to your girl. The same is true for your situation. You don't need to spend every minute with her. Just let her know that she is number one in your heart. Tell her how much you care about her and that you think of her when you're tending to your priorities. Be busy. Do your thing. Just give her the right feeling and let her know that she's your number one girl and your relationship problem will be solved. Okay. Take care of yourself. I want to hear back at how well you're doing and invite me to the wedding. All right. I have another caller on the line and his name is Joseph. Hello, Joseph. What is your question for me? Well, I've been in a relationship for seven years with a woman and uh, we have three kids together and I found out a month ago recently that she cheated. And it, it bothers me in a way because I said to myself, why would she do something like that? She held it back for a while. I, I, I somewhat knew that she did something wrong, but she just like nudged it off. Tonight we got into an argument because I, 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 I woke up, I, I work at night, I work a lot. I woke up and I, and she was on Facebook. And I always say to myself, why are you always on Facebook? It's like you spend more time on Facebook than you do anything else. Like you spend 25 to 30 hours a week on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And we got three kids. And it's like I work at night. I come home. I go to sleep. I do wake up and, and periodically, like, say, around about 4 o'clock, because I say to myself, I got to give them some, some quality time. But it seems like that's not good enough for her. I mean, she does cook. She does clean. She acts like a housewife. But it's like the communication just isn't there, no matter how much I try to communicate with her or how much I try to tell her, well, this bothers me and that bothers me. It's like she thinks I'm combative about it. I mean, we started uh, relationship counseling like a month and a half ago, and we started to solve some issues, but it's, it's still issues there that is deep-rooted and it just can't get solved. Okay, Joseph, cheating is a symptom of a deeper problem. Just as a headache is a symptom of hormone imbalances, or maybe spinal misalignment, low blood sugar, or even a brain tumor. Cheating is a symptom that something is broken in the relationship. The cheater is saying in a nonverbal, behavioral way, F you. You're not meeting my needs. Now, I'm not saying it's right to cheat. She shouldn't have cheated on you. It's not the right way to communicate her relationship discontent. Cheating is not a healthy way for a person to express his or her discontent. But... If you want to heal your relationship and the wound that's been caused by the cheating, and if you want to immunize your relationship against future cheating, you, Joseph, are going to need to make a radical shift. And this shift is going to be the hardest thing that you've ever had to do. Because the natural reaction is to point your finger at the cheater and blame her for cheating on you. But doing this is only going to cause her to blame you in return, and soon you're going to be fighting junkies. So what I want you to do is to point the finger back at yourself. You have to make the radical shift to take responsibility for not meeting her needs. You have to face the fact that you pushed her away from you without realizing it. So she escaped to Facebook because she wasn't getting something that she needed from you. Now, I want you to go and talk to her from this place where you're willing to look at yourself. Tell her that you want her to let you know how you let her down. Listen to what she says and accept responsibility for your role in disappointing her. Now, the only way for you both to go forward is for you both to stop pointing the finger at each other, listen and understand each other, and truly invest in being responsive to each other's needs. And if you're both focused on being responsive to the other, you'll both get your needs met and you'll live happily ever after. I mean it, Joseph. So thank you for your call. And let me know how you make out. Okay. Now I have Diana on the line. Welcome to the show, Diana. What's your question for me? Hi. I am 32. I've been dating my boyfriend for two years, living with him for one year, and he has been separated from his ex-wife for three years. 
she has their two children, and um, the end of their relationship was just horrible. It brought out the worst in both of them, and she still emails probably 20, 25 times a day. Sometimes we'll call for like an hour solid, um, and he won't talk to her, but he still maintains the relationship so that he can keep in touch with the children. She, she's calling, and he, he doesn't answer. He replies very limited. Um, she drives him crazy. But he, he keeps contact with her, like, an email every couple of days just to keep contact with the kids. The problem is I hate her. I have to sit there and listen to the phone ring for an hour, and I have to deal with him when he's gotten 25 emails, hateful emails from her in the day. Okay, Diana, the problem here isn't really with his ex. The problem is that you are upset with your boyfriend for not setting better limits on her his ex. As a result, she's intruding on your time together. He's upset and you're feeling cheated of quality time with him. I get it. I know that he has kids with his ex, so he needs to have some contact with her. And I also heard that he's not responding to most of her calls. But the fact that he responds to some of her calls is actually reinforcing her incessant calling. What he's doing is called intermittent conditioning. Take the example of a dog begging at the table. If the dog begs and whines and only gets a scrap some of the time, that little scrap is enough to reinforce his persistent begging at the table. Same thing with his ex. If he responds to her some of the time, that shows her that her persistent calling eventually pays off. So, Diana, he needs to tell her, No more calls. They must schedule a time to talk about the kids, and that's the only time that she can call him. And he has to turn his phone off and not respond to emails. If he does this consistently over six weeks, he will succeed in changing this pattern. It takes about six weeks for someone to be reconditioned in his or her behavior. Okay, now we also need to focus on you, Diana, because you said you're going crazy. Strong feelings that you can't shake are a sign that you're dealing with an unhealed wound from childhood. So keep in mind that the unconscious mind is constantly associating present-day events with past traumas from our formative years. And I suspect that this triangle is reminding you of something painful that happened to you when you were a kid. Perhaps a parent ignored you in favor of one of your siblings or gave you more attention than or gave your sibling more attention than you. So I want you to take a trip down memory lane and figure out what wound has been awakened in you. And when you make the link, you're going to feel calmer. And when your wound is healed and he sets better limits, you're going to have the winning combination for getting past this impasse. So I want to hear how you do, Diana, and thank you for your call. Okay, for my final call, I have Alex on the line. Go ahead, Alex. Tell me what question you have for me. Um, I have a problem. Me and my girlfriend are always fighting, and I just don't know what to do anymore. Like, um, we'll be talking randomly, and then I'll say something, and she'll hear it, and she'll just yell at me. She'll be so irritated of what I say, and she'll just tell me to shut up. And, I mean, I love her to death, and I'm, I'm just, we've been together for three years. It's like, it's not like it was when we were first dating. Everything just flipped. Okay, Alex, you're absolutely right to say the relationship isn't the same as it was in the beginning. What's happening to you is called the transference. So let me break this down for you. At around the two-year mark, every couple begins to experience what's called the unconscious transference distortion. I know it's a mouthful, but this is an unconscious process in which the mind sees your partner as the parent that you had trouble with. And when this happens, you begin to have very strong emotional reactions because you're actually feeling all the negative feelings you felt toward the parent who hurt you or let you down. So now when you talk to her, she's getting hurt because she hears her parent attacking and criticizing her. And believe it or not, this is actually a divine chance to help her heal her old scar from childhood. And most couples miss this chance entirely because when a partner is angry at you and pointing a finger at you, you get defensive and it causes more fighting and you don't feel like helping the other person to heal. 
So what you need to do is give her the kind of response that she always needed from her parent and didn't get. And we're going to use your relationship to help heal her old scars. And what you need to say to help her heal is, when you get mad and scream at me, I can't hear you. And I want to understand what I said or did to upset you. So please tell me slowly and calmly what I did and how you feel. And as you become the healing parent who cares about her, who's listening to all her hurt and her trouble, the hurt and anger from her childhood is going to melt like cotton candy in the sun. And as she calms down and heals, your fights are going to be a thing of the past. And you will live happily ever after. You will see. So I want you to keep in touch with me. And I want you to let me know how well you make out. All right. I'm going to take a quick break. And when I return, I'm going to be putting John Travolta on my celebrity couch. Be right back. Now back to Ask Dr. Love with Jamie Turndorf, Ph.D. Once again, here's Dr. Love. Welcome back to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Now is the time in the program for my celebrity couch. But before I lay John on the couch, I just want to take a moment to talk with you about how my method differs from what you may have read, seen, or heard from other shrinks and relationship experts. The majority of therapists today practice a type of therapy that's called cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. This method focuses on changing your thoughts and your behaviors, and there is no discussion of feelings whatsoever. To me, this method reduces humans to robots, and the therapists act as mechanics who program you to think and act differently. I've found that this approach is sorely lacking. Because even if you try to force yourself to act and think differently, if you don't get at the underlying forces that fuel your thoughts and your behavior and heal these forces, you can't make any lasting changes. Out of my Center for Emotional Communication, I've spent the past 30 years conducting observational research to uncover what causes our intimate relationships to fail or flourish. And this has led me to create my core therapy method. My method helps you to unearth and heal the early wounds, what I call the old scars, that shaped your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. So instead of Band-Aid therapies, which offer quick fixes and behavioral tricks that cover the wounds that fester inside all of us, I dig deep to uncover and heal the core of your problem, the buried wounds that actually cause most of your personal and relationship woes. In this era of quick fixes and superficiality, I know that encouraging you to be patient and delve a little deeper to understand yourself and your partner is bucking a popular trend. But, oh, is the effort worth it? Think of your relationships as being like fine wines. They improve with time. So be patient. Give yourself and your partner this gift of taking the time to look deeper. Once you help each other to uncover and heal your core wounds and the feelings associated with them, you won't need to reach out to me in six months, a year, or ten years from now because the same problem has popped up again. Not that I don't want to hear from you. I do want to hear from you. But I want to hear that you have gone on to lead a happier and more productive life for life. And that's what you're going to be telling me when you follow my method. So rescue yourself from one more day of heartache. Protect your health from the deadly effects of no relationship or troubled relationships. Create the best, most loving relationship in the world. And since all of us carry old wounds, do yourself a favor. Share this information with your partner, spouse, friends, and loved ones. And encourage them to join you in the journey of self-healing. All right. Now on to my celebrity couch. Beware, this next bit contains sexually explicit information and is intended for adult listeners only. So have you heard the latest scuttlebutt on Buttman John Travolta? Well, according to reports, John Travolta's recent request for a butt massage is but a taste of the alleged smorgasbord of sexual misconduct that he's been up to. This week, two male massage therapists have filed sexual battery and sexual assault charges against John Travolta. And from what I hear, 
other alleged victims are coming out of the woodwork, claiming that Travolta tried to put the wood to them, too. John, what are you doing? Holding open auditions for a Saturday Night Fever sequel to be called Saturday Night Favors? (laughs) But seriously, while Travolta's lawyer says the charges are bogus, there seems to be a lot of hard evidence mounting against you. In fact, one of the accusers actually passed a lie detector test for the National Enquirer. Brace yourself for what's coming next. Here's a down and dirty but brief debriefing of both Masseur's legal complaints. According to the records, and I'm quoting, Travolta's massage began in a bungalow at the Beverly Hilton Hotel. Travolta appeared to be semi-erect and he touched plaintiff's scrotum. The plaintiff told Travolta to please not touch him again. The lawsuit states that the actor promised not to, but Travolta quickly tried to rub the head of plaintiff's penis as he tried to pull away. The documents also state that Travolta started to apologize for his behavior and tried to imply that they must have gotten their signals crossed and that he thought the plaintiff wanted the same thing he did. The record continues, plaintiff explained that he did not ever have sex with his clients and that expecting sexual situations when people are providing paid services was essentially prostitution. Travolta tried to act like it was a simple misunderstanding. Plaintiff told Travolta that a masseur lying on the table was unlawful and inappropriate. Travolta said, quote, come on, dude, I'll jerk you off. In his next stunt, the Pulp Fiction star seemed bent on expanding his repertoire to include the role of pimp. He dangled the promise of a menage a trois with a Hollywood actress staying at the hotel who, quote, wanted three-way sex and wanted to be double penetrated. Travolta said they could have that later, but first they needed to have sex together before calling her, so this way they would be in sync with each other sexually. After threatening to call the cops, the masseur alleges he He was dropped off where Travolta had picked him up and that the actor called him selfish and a loser. Travolta gave the masseur $800, double what he was owed. Were the bucks intended to buy his silence or assuage a guilty conscience? The second plaintiff said in the record that he doesn't normally do in-room massages and asked a co-worker to take the assignment. But he declined because he knew that Travolta had been banned from a spa that the co-worker used to work at in Los Angeles. The masseur bit the bullet and gave Travolta the in-room massage. But, quote, as he was massaging near Travolta's buttocks area, Travolta would open his legs and spread his butt cheeks open and had a full erection and would maneuver in a way to try to force plaintiff number two to touch his anus and around his anus. According to the lawsuit, the masseur tried to carry out a deep tissue massage, but Travolta had removed his draping and was masturbating. Quote, Travolta's penis was fully erect and was roughly eight inches in length, and his pubic hair was wiry and unkempt. Sweat was pouring down Travolta's neck, and he asked plaintiff to say something nice to him. So what can be made of Travolta's insistence that he's the butt of false accusations? According to Carrie Fisher, who told The Advocate, everyone knows Travolta is gay. And by the way, Travolta was first publicly called gay by porn star Paul Barisi, who gave a tell-all interview about an alleged gay relationship with Travolta in the 1980s. He later recanted that story and then subsequently said the story was true. What's more, other men have come forward alleging sexual contact with John. So let's get to the bottom of what's happening here. Now I'm going to switch on my thinking cap or shrinking cap, and put together all the pieces of John's case. According to a reliable source, John seems to be gay but padlocked in the closet. John's son, Jet, died in 2009. One of the alleged victims said that Travolta exhibited a strange demeanor and had bloodshot eyes. Putting all these details together and considering that I never read accounts of Travolta's alleged sexual acting out prior to 2009... I'm thinking that Travolta may be abusing drugs, perhaps as a way to self-medicate his grief. Speaking of grief, I understand that John's son died of a bee sting. Just so you know, I have first-hand experience with tragic loss. If you haven't already heard, my beloved husband of nearly 30 years also died of a bee sting a few years ago. And my experience confirms that the literature is correct in the fact that tragic 
accidental death is the toughest to handle because those left behind have no chance to prepare for the loss, unlike when someone dies a slow, degenerative death. And I've also discovered that, contrary to popular belief, time does not diminish the sense of loss. We never stop loving or missing a loved one who has passed over. Unfortunately, our fast-paced Western culture has also put the grieving process on the fast track. The Western medical establishment has followed suit by expecting the bereaved to grieve, let go, and move on in six months. What's more, if grief lasts any longer, it's considered pathological. And since the majority of the Western world has adopted this bogus philosophy, nobody has the patience to listen to those who are grieving beyond the six-month mark. On top of that, nobody wants to have a psychiatric label slapped on him or her. So in the end, those who grieve are forced to go underground with their pain. Added to all this is the fact that traditional Christian religions tell us that we must wait until we die to be reunited with loved ones in heaven. This means the bereaved are expected to live their lives in limbo, disconnected from those they love most. Thanks to my own spiritual encounters with my husband, I have been shown that there is life after life and that what we've been taught about heaven is dead wrong. Heaven is a state, not a place. Heaven is all around you. Heaven is here and now. This means relationships need not end in death, and the bereaved don't need to wait until they die and go to heaven to reconnect with loved ones in spirit. Given that Scientology embraces the notion of afterlife, if only John were to practice what his faith preaches, he could reconnect rather than say goodbye to Jet. If only John were to say hello to Jet, he would discover great relief for his grief and pain. The point is, there are other options besides getting wasted to numb grief, and there's more. John also appears to be sexually closeted, and because drugs lower inhibitions, John may also be using drugs to free himself up to act on his closeted homosexual urges. Because John was raised in a traditional Italian Catholic background, he was surely fed by and gay phobic messages. And then to add insult to injury, being a Scientologist, John must surely buy into L. Ron Hubbard, the movement founder's views on homosexuality, as an illness to be cured. Well, if only John could put Hubbard in the cupboard and deal directly with the man or woman, he would discover that God loves and accepts everyone, straight, gay, and bi. So, John, embrace your true sexuality, because if you don't, all your repressed, pent-up urges are going to explode in uncontrollable ways, which is, which is just what's happening. And for the record, if you accepted your sexuality, you wouldn't need to use drugs to unlock the door to your self-imposed sexual closet. And there's more. Since you're a Scientologist, John, you probably buy into the official party line, which says that psychology is destructive and abusive. But the fact is your behavior is abusive of others as well as yourself. And on top of all this, Scientology followers tend to glorify human will to the extreme and think themselves superior to others. It seems that this has allowed John to act out at will as if being a megastar weren't enough to inflate your ego. Now, while I'm not a de devotee of Scientology or entirely steep, steeped in its sci-fi mystical doctrine, it's not clear to me how giving a hand job in a massage parlor is going to help free you of your engrams so you reach your goal of being clear and being reborn on a planet in a distant galaxy. And I'm pretty sure the galactic emperor Xenu would not approve. The bottom line is this, John. No matter what your woes, you need to behave yourself and keep it in your pants. And John, while we're on the subject, it's time to stop playing the part of a dog trying to hump every warm leg in the neighborhood. Well, that's all I have for you tonight. It's been my pleasure to be with you on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Remember to join me next week when I share my top tips for how to listen with your heart. Until we're together again, I wish you a week filled with lots of love and kick that fighting junkie monkey to the curb. Fax back the agreement now for Ask Dr. Love or call Syndication Network's toll-free to lock in your market. Syndication Network.